quietly, almost unnoticed, really, the God of heaven just slipped into our world. No fanfare. Some shepherds were waking up, woken up one night by angels, but, but for the most part, people didn't know. People didn't notice that divinity moved in to humanity. Jesus was born in the humility of a stable, the king of glory, but with no king's fanfare. The prince of peace, but, but with no celebration from the world around. God invited some wise men through a star, some shepherds through angels. But most people went to bed that night and woke up the next day, and the world didn't seem different to them. But it had changed completely because eternity had broken in to the temporary world that we live in. We have a hard time even beholding this topic of eternity. Because everything we see, everything we experience is just so temporary and constantly changing. Even the things that we think won't change seem to change. I remember uh, years ago as a, as a young kid watching this dynamic futuristic show called The Jetsons. <laughs> Anybody remember The Jetsons? Meet George Jetson, Jane, his wife, daughter Judy, his son, Elroy. Yeah, that, that show. And, and on that show were these mind-boggling futuristic realities, these things that, that would never happen. That, that there's no way in our lifetime or in 10 lifetimes things like this would happen. For instance, I remember in the Jetsons' home, they had a, they had a telephone. But this telephone had a screen and when they talked on the phone, the people, are you ready for this? They could see each other. It was freaky. It was weird. I mean, what kind of wild thinking could imagine such a world? On my iPhone, I can be in New Zealand or Australia and call someone and FaceTime and talk to a person looking at their face. The things that seem, you know, unchangeable just keep changing. When I was a kid, Pluto was a planet. <laughs> it's been downgraded. Poor Pluto. <laughs> when I was a kid in school, they taught us cursive writing. Do you know they don't teach that in school anymore? That's what I've been told. And I think it's not going to be long before they don't even teach printing. Because you write like this. <laughs> With your thumbs, right? Nothing seems to stay the same. When I was a kid, milk was good for you. <laughs> Every day at lunch, you, you had to drink a little cardboard box a little carton of milk because it, may, it would give you what? Strong bones and strong teeth, right? And now it just makes you gaseous if you're lactose intolerant. You know, it's like, it's like the, the whole world. Yeah, it, everything seems temporary. Everything seems changing. And so the idea of eternity, of things going on forever and ever, even the things that we think are solid and unchanging, are changing with almost a rapid transitioning world around us. So how do our minds get, get around this concept of eternity? Tonight we're going to just spend a few moments and think about this idea, behold, the door to eternity, the way to eternity, because that's what Christmas is about. Jesus is the door to eternity. And so what I want to do is I want to let the word of God speak to you. I want to let the scriptures, the, these God-breathed words given by the very spirit of the living God, spoken into the hearts and the minds and the lives of real people in real times spanning thousands of years from then till now and throughout the history of the Bible, 
They give us this picture of an eternal vision that our minds have a hard time understanding, but if we can get it and understand it, it changes everything because we discover that this life is less than that in the scope of eternity. And this Jesus who came on Christmas came to open the door. He came as the door to eternity. The longing of the human heart is to know that this life is not all there is. There is hope in and beyond this life. There is hope beyond this life. When things are hard, when things are painful, when loneliness just covers your heart like a blanket and you say, am I always going to feel this way? If you know Jesus, the answer is no. Not, just, not even in this lifetime, but certainly not for eternity. And the pain and the loss and the struggle of this life, will it always be this way? No. God reconciles all things in himself in the presence of Jesus Christ. When relationships are tense and, and, and conflicted, will it always be like this? No. Things will be made right and set right. When our bodies ache and the pain ju just comes unannounced over and over again. And we say, will it always feel this way? The answer is no. Not in the scope of eternity. And all of these things will pass before we know it. And God will open the door through Jesus for an eternity beyond our comprehension. In the book of Ecclesiastes, maybe the most depressing book in the Bible. Jeremiah would probably be a rival, but there's certain books in the Bible that just deal with pain and struggle. And Ecclesiastes deals with just the struggle of, of, of life and what's it about. And, and in Ecclesiastes, there's, there's this little nugget found in chapter three, verses nine to 11. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And listen to this. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. God has set eternity in our hearts. There's something in us that longs to, to know, is there more than this life? And the answer is yes. The problem is we don't live many days with our eyes beyond right where I am. This, this is why suicide is skyrocketing among young people. Because they look at life the way it is right now at, at this moment. And they say it's always going to be like this. And God says, turn your eyes up from here and look to heaven and look to eternity and live with hope. We have to learn to see that this life is just the beginning of what God has for us if we've come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John, chapter three, verses 16 and 17, maybe the most well-known passage in all the Bible because people hold up a sign with this passage in the end zones of football games and in different sporting events. People say, what does that mean? They go and look it up. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have, read the next two words with me, eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. This is a hope of eternity found in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10, beginning in verse seven, Jesus says this, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. This is the way, the way in, the way through. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. He's the shepherd. He's the gate. He opens the way. And then he says this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. A full life now and a full life forever, for eternity. How long is eternity? Really, really, really long. I mean, it, try, try to, okay, is it, okay, like a thousand years? No, that's just like the beginning, the preface of the book of eternity. Oh, so eternity is like a million years? No, it's, it's eternity. It's forever. Our brains can't even get around that, but God says, at least let it start to get into your soul. He's placed eternity in our hearts. Begin to long for that which God offers. God's divine design is that he's made us for eternity. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the entire chapter is dealing with this idea of resurrection and eternity and new life. And there's a, I'm gonna read just a little piece of it. It's a long chapter. But I'm gonna read just a little piece. And, and just let the truth of God's word sink into your soul. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50, the apostle Paul writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This is this eternal kingdom that God has established. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That sleep is a word for death. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory, here it is, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. amen. He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. The perishable becomes imperishable. The mortal becomes immortal. I don't expect you by the end of this service to say, oh, I get it. <laughs> okay, I, yeah, yeah, it all makes sense to me. I got eternity all figured out. You'll never fully get it but we should turn our eyes to eternity more than we do. When this life is hard and difficult, and it gets that way sometimes, true? Gets that way sometimes. Some of you go, it gets that way a lot of the time. There's a hope of eternity that God gives to us because Jesus Christ has won the victory. Because eternity belongs to those who know Jesus. Eternity in the presence of God in heaven. C.S. Lewis, the great thinker who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, the Space Trilogy, Mere Christianity, incredible books, just a brilliant thinker. C.S. Lewis wrote these words about us as people. Listen to this. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This does not mean that we are to be perpetually solemn. We must play, but our merriment must be of that kind. And it is, in fact, the merriest kind which exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. Not flippin not flippin no flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. To understand that the woman who I will go home with tonight is an immortal being made in the image of God and saved by Jesus Christ ought to change the way I function as a husband. True? To understand that the people who are ahead of us in our car getting out of the parking lot at church when things are going a little slow because there's only one exit to the parking lot are immortal beings made in the image of the living God. Should give us a little more patience and a little bit more kindness. To understand that every human being has been made by God. And the staggering thought is that every person will either be eternally with God through faith in Jesus or eternally separate from God through rejection of Jesus is a sobering thought. Eternity is something very, very serious that we don't think about in the flow of a normal day, and I hope after tonight we do more. Behold, Jesus offers what your heart longs for. He offers eternal life that he's bought for us. Ephesians 2 Four through five says this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, listen to these words, made us alive with Christ. 
even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Our etern- if, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, and I think for the most part, if you're up at 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve and you're here, I hope you know and love Jesus. If you don't, I hope by the time tonight's over, you'll say, I want to know this Jesus. But it's by his grace that we're saved. What a reminder. We don't have to try to be good enough for God to say, okay, 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 you passed the grade. You did enough good things. You, you, you've, you've kind of taken the scales of, of dumb, bad stuff and sin and good things. You did enough good things that you tipped the scales and now you get into heaven. It doesn't work that way. Because one sin is infinitely heavy against a holy God. And you put it on the scales, one sin and all my good things, and it goes like this, boom. The problem is we don't just have one sin. We got plenty of sins every day. So how do you tip those scales? Well, the weight of the glory of Jesus, when you receive him, goes like this, boom, and all your sins are gone. By his grace, not by your good works. And then in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 to 13, we read this. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know this. That you may be sure of it. That your heart may be rock solid in that reality. That eternal life is yours, not because you've done enough good things, but because Jesus did the one thing you needed. He gave his life on the cross to wash you clean. And when you said yes to him, everything else was washed away. Game, set, match, done. When you receive Jesus Christ, your sin is gone. That's how it works. That's the grace of God. And eternity with the living, loving God becomes yours through Jesus Christ. And heaven is your home. I believe what the Bible teaches is this, that when you become a follower of Jesus, your eternity has already begun. It'll get a lot better than this, I guarantee you. But, but this life is gonna launch you into an eternity with the Father. So it's Christmas. What do we do? We unwrap and enjoy the gift you've been waiting for. How do we let the hope and certainty of heaven shine into this life, even when things seem dark? I want to think together about how we really begin to let the light shine. In just a short time when we have, we're going to share communion together and then we're going to have a time where we light candles together and just think about the light of Jesus, but also the light he shines through us. I want to think with you about how do we live lives that begin to shine this light. If, if we are not mere mortals, if we've come to the cross and received Jesus, should it change our lives today? The answer is yes. Should the light of Jesus start to shine through us in fresh new ways? The answer is yes. Well, what does that look like? Well, I want to light a few candles here, and I want to think about this together. Each candle is going to represent a different, just a different idea of what it means to to walk and live in the light of Jesus, to shine the light of Jesus, to realize that he is the eternal God, and he lives within us, and he's called us his own, and we now have become those who seek him in this life and forever. How do we do this? We live with a profound awareness that Jesus is alive, present, engaged, and in love with you. You live with that awareness that he's near and he loves you. I want to encourage you to talk with Jesus all day long. You want to begin to walk in the light of Jesus, to shine the light of Jesus, just just talk with him all day long with your eyes closed and talk to him with your eyes wide open. Start your day with these words. You're laying in bed. Instead of kind of starting to spin, oh, what's going to happen today? What's going to go wrong? Ah." Instead of going down that road, just say, good morning, Jesus. You've given me another day to live for you. Talk with him through your day. On your drive to work, on your drive to school, on your walk to work, talk with him. Talk with them in the tough times. Talk with them in the good times. Talk with Jesus all day long. How do we begin to shine his light? 
Notice Jesus. Notice the presence of God. Do you understand that this eternal God is not only preparing heaven for you, but he's breaking into your life right now, every moment of every day? And so just notice where God is at work. Listen for his voice to speak to you. I have a friend in the military who's been part of Shoreline Church for some time, but now he's been deployed and he's in another part of the world. But I think almost every single Sunday since he's left, I get an email from him on Sunday. There's no church for him to go to where he's been assigned right now. So he goes to Shoreline still. Even though he's on the other side of the globe. And every Sunday, he writes me a quick little email after he's been to church at Shoreline, which is after the 10 o'clock service. I don't even know what time it is where he is. It's not 10 o'clock in the morning. But our 10 o'clock service is a live stream, and he watches it. And here's what amazed me over the last three, four, five weeks. Every single week, the message that was preached hits him exactly where he is. How does that happen? I know plenty of people who've been here the last five weeks that nothing hit them. <laughs> Why, how, how is it that every single week the message has been exactly what he needs to hear and he sends me an email and he tells me back what the message I just preached? How is that? Because he's paying attention to the presence and the power and the glory of God. Every message hits them, not because somehow my preaching is powerful, but because he's responsive to God's presence and God's work. Get the point? Notice God at work. Watch what he's doing. How do we shine the light as we prepare to walk with God into eternity? Declare the truth. Declare the truth. I am loved by an eternal God. I am loved by God. Declare it. I am loved by God. Declare it. I am loved by God. Declare it like you mean it. I am loved by God. Declare it like you're part of a church that gets really enthusiastic when they're hearing a sermon. <laughs> I am loved by God. Because it's true. And then, you want to shine the light of eternity, look at someone else and say, you are loved by God. Give it a try. Oh, yeah. Some of you are shy. I don't know if I want to say it. Well, you don't know who I'm sitting next to. Uh, I tell you, they're loved by God and you're loved by God. We can shine the light of eternity in so many ways. We invite Jesus to lead you. Invite Jesus to lead you each and every day of your life. Respond to the whispers, the shouts, and the movements of the Holy Spirit. Respond to what God is doing. And so, listen to God's teaching through his word. I want to challenge you as we come to the end of a year and begin to walk into a new year. I want to challenge you to really begin thinking about what it means to open the word of God and do what it says. If there's one thing you can do in this new year, we're going to do this Healthy Life series starting the first Sunday of the year, but if there's one thing you can do in this new year to be healthier than you've ever been before is to open up the word of God Every day, read something in the Bible and say, okay, God, what do you have to say to me? And let God transform your life. Make time to be quiet. You want to walk in the glory of eternity. Boy, I love the opening of the service tonight uh, with the music. Just some, did, did you notice just some quiet music for a little bit? There like, for a little bit, there was no singing. It's like, well, you know, are we going to sing? What's the deal? They're just kind of playing quietly. And I just found myself just, Standing over here just going, oh, this is good. <laughs> just have a quiet moment among God's people to listen for the voice of God. Commit yourself to make time to be quiet and to sit in the presence of God. How do I walk in the glory of eternity and share it with others? Here's a word of encouragement. Repent quickly. Be a person that repents quickly. When you're off the track, when you're not living the way God wants you to, when you're making unwise choices, just, just, just repent. Stop and turn around. Well, well when? I'll, I'll wait a week. I'll, I'll wait a month. I'll wait an hour. No, repent now. When you realize that you're heading the wrong direction, just stop and turn around and seek the God who's preparing a place for you, who loves you. Learn to repent quickly. Shine the light, his light, everywhere you go. 
Be a person that says, I want to shine the light of Jesus. In a moment, you're gonna hold one of these candles and you're gonna hold a light and as you do, I want you to look at that and I want you to think about what does it mean to really shine the light of Jesus? I would say one way we do that is we pray for those who are hurting. You know, there's people all around you who are hurting and struggling and going through hard times. You have moments like that. You may be in that right now. But you don't have to look very far to find somebody who's hurting and struggling. And when you bump into the person like that, whether you know them well or whether you just met them, I want to give you a word of encouragement. You want to shine the light of the eternal God right where you are. You talk with somebody, and if they, if they have the courage to look at you and say, I'm going through a hard time, I'm struggling, I'm hurting, then you have the courage to say, could I take just a moment and say a prayer for you? I'm not talking about I'll pray for you when I get home. I mean, right now, at that moment. Some of you say, well, it terrifies me to pray out loud in front of somebody else. Here's my pastoral challenge. Get over it. <laughs> my wife, when she started college, was a, gonna be a, an RA, a resident, a resident assistant, and she found out at this Christian college she had to pray with all the women on the floor. Scared her to death. My wife, who now will stand up here and preach and pray, you go, well, that would never scare Sherry. Oh, scared her to death. She thought about not being an RA. And another woman said to her, hey, let's just get together and practice. Let's just pray together over and over and over and over until you finally aren't afraid anymore. I never knew Sherry when she was afraid to pray in front of other people. She was. How'd she get past it? By doing it. Pray with people who are hurting, who are struggling, and let the glory of God show up. Rejoice with those who are going through good times. You want to show the presence and the glory of God. I have the courage to be happy for other people. I have other pastors from around our community and around the world who will actually share good things that are going on with me. And they'll say to me, you're like one of the few pastors I know that gets excited with me. You think, well, every pastor gets excited when something good's happening with another pastor, when their church is growing, where good things happen. But that's not true. One of the things I love about Monterey Church over here in Alvarado Street, right here in Monterey, Pastor Mike, one of their pastors, was here at one of our services today. He was gonna be preaching at two services in his church but he came to worship with us. And he came up to me after the service, standing right here, and he just said, man, what a great time to be here. I just love being in worship. And gave a word of blessing. He rejoiced. That's what we should do with each other. That, is, that inspired me. Because a lot of local pastors are like jealous of other churches rather than being happy for them. We should be thrilled and happy and excited when God's doing good things in other people. Tell your story. Tell your story of how you came to know Jesus. Tell your story about how Jesus is working in your life. Tell your story often, and in your story, tell his story. Because his story has transformed your story. And then, how else do you shine the light? This one's for you, to light. Find ways, if the eternal God of glory lives in you, if heaven is your home, if God is preparing a place for you, then I, I challenge you to say, God, how can I shine the light of eternity in this dark world? God has ways he wants to work with you. And in a moment, you're gonna hold, after communion, you're gonna hold a candle and light it. This, that's your candle, this is your light. What, what, you're gonna say, God, what is a way I can shine my light to show the eternal God is alive and working in me and shine a light through you? Oh God, we pray that you would meet us as we come to the table in just a moment. As we break the bread, as we drink the cup, as we share together the broken body of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus, as we remember you, oh Jesus. Meet us in this time. Meet us in this place. Jesus, you set the table for us when you broke the bread and said, this is my body, broken for you, when you poured out the cup and said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. God, you set the table even here tonight because you are present by your spirit. And so we pray that we would meet you at the table, that we would experience your presence and your glory, and that we would be reminded that we are people of eternity because an eternal God entered history an eternal God died for our sins. An eternal God rose again. And you 
Oh, Jesus, our eternal God, have called us your children through faith in your name. Meet us at the table, we pray, in Jesus' name. The Apostle Paul wrote these words in 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When Jesus sat at that table with his disciples, the first communion, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Each time you gather, each time you break the bread and partake of it, each time you, you pour out the cup and drink of it, he says, remember me. What does that mean? In, in just a moment, you're gonna receive the elements. And we're gonna do communion a little bit different uh, tonight. We're gonna actually have the elements passed to where you are. So if, you're, if there's maybe a little space between you and someone else, be ready to kind of move over and hand it to the next person down, down your row. But when the bread comes, take a piece of bread and just hold it in your hand. When the cup comes, take the cup and hold it in your hand. And then just as you hold those elements, as you remember the body of Christ and the blood of, the blood of Jesus, just remember Jesus. Well, what can you remember? Here's some thoughts. These things that will prepare you to reflect on who Jesus is and what he did. Remember that Jesus left the glory of heaven to be born in a stable. Remember Christmas Day, that Jesus left glory and splendor and majesty and was born so humbly so quietly. Maybe as you hold the elements, you just want to think about, about Bethlehem's manger and God slipping into human history. Another thing we can remember is that Jesus lived a life of radical, like radical love and kindness. And so when you're holding that bread and you're holding that cup, I just look at it and think about that word radical. I like that word being from Southern California. You know, I never thought I'd be at the pulpit saying radical so much. But what's radical is his love for you, for me, for us. So radical that he would go to the cross willingly. Yeah. No one took his life. He laid it down for you and for me. What causes someone to do that? Radical love. Radical love. Yeah. Remember that. As you hold the bread and hold the cup, as you remember Jesus, remember that he took away your sin and your shame. All your sin, all your shame, all your guilt, all your punishment. His broken body, his shed blood paid the price and your sin is gone. Remember that as we come to the table. And one more thing I think for me, I just when I remember why we come to the table and what Jesus did. Uh, church, let's, let's remember that when <laughs> Jesus laid his life down, he rose again. Yeah. Death could not hold him. He rose again in victory and in power, breaking the, the back of sin and death and the grave and the enemy of our soul. Yeah. Let's remember that as we hold the bread and we hold the cup, that Jesus' body was broken. His blood was shed but it didn't end there because he rose again in victory and he offers life and life to the full, the exact same things that Pastor Kevin was just preaching about. Thank God for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. We will. <laughs> we'll remember that. Yeah. And as you hold the bread and as you hold the cup, remember this. This isn't the end of the story. Yeah. He's gone ahead of us to prepare a place and heaven awaits you. Remember that Jesus Christ, even now, is preparing a place for you beyond your wildest dreams and beyond your wildest comprehensions. In just a moment, our servers are gonna come and ask the servers to begin to, to serve the elements. And as they come, as the bread comes to you, take the bread and hold it in one hand. Take the cup and hold it in your other hand. And, and, and as you do, just begin to pray. And there'll be some quiet music playing. And just stay right where you are, in your seat, 
and hold those elements and remember Jesus. Let this be time to pray, to remember, to think deeply about Jesus. Take this quiet time to meet with your Savior. when you have the elements, just hold them and don't partake until uh, everyone's been served and we're gonna partake together as a sign of our unity in Jesus. So just take the elements and hold on to them. Let's make sure all of our servers have bread in a cup. We have a few being served still on the top of the balcony, so we'll wait until you're served and we'll partake together in a moment. Mm. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we hold in our hands these simple reminders but they're not so simple. They remind us that your body was broken so that we could be made whole. They remind us that your blood was shed so our sins would be washed away. We'd be made clean in your sight. So as we partake of these elements, Lord, meet with us. The bread which we break is our communion of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a sign of our unity in Jesus Christ, let's partake of the bread together. (laughs) 
and the cup of blessing reminds us of the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And not just the world, you, me, we're in that. Lamb of God takes away your sin, my sin. Remember his willing sacrifice to lay down his life, his radical love, pour it out for you and for me. As a symbol of unity, let's partake and juice together. Hmm. Father, thank you. Thank you for an opportunity to do this together. To remember, remember your love, your sacrifice, the life that you gave so that we can have life and life to the full, eternal. We're not mere mortals. But because of you, through faith in you, we're immortal, we're beloved, we're given life and purpose. And for that, we are so grateful and thankful. What a gift. Mm. The best gift we could ever have. Yeah. In Jesus' name, we never lose sight of that. Thank you on this Christmas mm-hmm. morning that we get, we get to remember that. Yes. We remember you, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We yeah. love you. We yeah. pray this all in the matchless name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.